Welcome to the Insatiable Ones podcast. I'm Samantha Hand and I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth episode of the Insatiable Ones podcast. And I'm really excited to be joined by the legendary Mike Christie today. There's probably really funny Mexican music going on in the background of this, isn't there? Because we're in a Mexican restaurant. Are we in? Is it Mexican? Yeah, I think this, I think this cocktail's Mexican. Is your cocktail Mexican? My cocktail's not there. <laughs> <laughs> My cocktail's gone. Really? I'm in conversation with acclaimed international director, Mike Christie, and fellow Insatiable One, of course. Number five. Number five. Yeah, yeah which Dids number was five. very upset about. But just he's to, number 13. Just to go on the record, Dids was very upset. That I was number five. Was he really yeah. upset? Oh my god! I think he should have been number five. He is their manager, and I should have been number six. But you're Mike. No, I should be number six. Oh, okay. And you're Mike Christie, so you get number oh. five. He's number thirteen. Oh, he can't really complain then, can he? He was number three hundred and something. I had to change it so. <laughs> because he asked. Um, right, tell us a bit. <laughs> Sorry, tell did. Us, tell us a bit about yourself. Me? Yes. Well, I'm from Manchester, originally. Where? Uh, where? Yeah. An area called Fallowfield. I know Fallowfield. Do My brother-in-law went to university there. I spent many a night in his house there. Mm. Well, I left there when I was very young. We moved around a lot, Manchester and Cheshire. Um, and then, and then uh, I did... I was... Re- when I was a teenager... Uh, I worked in a record shop called Amiga Records and um, and I started getting involved with bands when I was like 15, 16, so I started managing bands. And one of the bands I managed was called The Electric Crayons and the, uh, and the lead singer in The Electric Crayons was Tim Burgess. No. Yeah, and my boss in the record shop managed a band called Making Time um, and it was all very controversial, so I got to about, I think I was 18, and, uh, and I'd begun to sort of promote concerts and things like that. And, um, and then Tim Burgess left the Electric Crayons and, start, and joined Making Time, and they became the Charlatans. And I was quite annoyed by that. I think I was 19. And, um, and I got a job at EMI Records when, and, um, when I was 19. Not a very good job, kind of working in sales and promotions, but it, made, it moved me down south when I was 19. So um, suddenly I had this kind of career that I wasn't expecting to have in, down in the south of England. And, um, and, you know, but I loved music. That was kind of what I loved. And I was working at EMI and I lasted a year there and then the job sort of w- was turning into something else. They wanted me to move and I said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, don't want to move. Oh, hang on. There's some weird music going on. Um, <laughs> so so uh, anyway I left after a year and then I was 20 in London and uh, living just around the corner uh, from here in Shoreditch and and I was like oh what am I going to do and then I accidentally got a job in TV in news and I was doing that but it was only three days a week because it was a very long day so I got paid very well but I had quite a lot of time and so I started a business um, that year when I met Derek Jarman actually and uh, I was beginning to sort of start it and um, um, and uh, and then that TV news job was the last job I had I left it when I was 22 so I've only had two jobs wow. proper jobs wow. and I've been here in London since and I met Derek Jarman when I was 21 which changed everything there's a song playing on the radio Sky high in the airways on the morning show And there's a lifeline slipping
Derek Jarman made and released um, a set of films that he made for the Smiths called The Queen Is Dead. And I didn't know who Derek Jarman was, but I really liked the Smiths. And, um, and I was like, my God, these films are amazing, you know? Really unusual, because back then it was pretty crappy pop, you know, on the whole, in the mid 80s. And I liked the Smiths, but the videos were, you know, it was kind of all a bit kind of Bon Jovi and, you know, pretty glossy and glittery. And, um, and these films just really amazed me. And then, and then he, he had a movie out shortly after called The Last of England, which was a really depressing but amazing movie about kind of Thatcher's Britain. And it's very, very dark. And De- Derek discovered Tilda Swinton, and she was in that film. And, um, and that movie really opened my eyes to kind of a lot of different things that were politi- some of which were political, some of which were about kind of uh, sexual politics, some of which were about gender politics, some of which were about filmmaking and art, you know. And, um, and it really took me in a kind of different direction in terms of my interests in aesthetic and art and film. And, um, and then so I moved to London, I moved down south in 1988, moved to London in 1989 properly. And in 1990, started kind of working in telly and began to think about how I was going to do things in the music industry. And then 1991, via a friend, I met Derek John. At the exact moment, I was kind of getting to the point where I wanted to sort of start a business. I'd been doing things for about nine months, which were, were hinting at the business I was going to create, but I didn't know that. I was very young, you know? So... In 1991, I was 22 when I met Derek. And we, the first thing we did was a book called At Your Own Risk. And he'd, he'd just written a book that'd been a bestseller. And I was at his amazing house in Dungeness on the coast. And he was talking about the kind of next book. And he had the title, but he didn't know what the book was. And I, and I had this idea of what the book could be. And he went, oh, that's really good. You'll have to write it with me. So I spent, and because I was doing this three-day week in this news job, I spent the next... I spent, I spent... <laughs> I was thinking, who's that shrieker? <laughs> uh, what was the name, what was the name? 
Uh, oh yes, nine. <laughs> remember, nine. I know. Nine years old, so I was still in that TV job. Yeah, before it was, it was TVAM. TVAM. But yeah, but they had a proper. At that point, it had a proper news desk, whereas now they don't have proper news. So it was a proper news, and I was working on the news side. So I um, was doing this job and I was doing working three days a week so Derek said great well come and work with me and we'll do this book and then I spent the next uh, three or four months doing that with Derek and, and then whilst that was going on we ended up doing all sorts of other stuff so I ended up working with him in the Pet Shop Boys and uh, working with him on some movie things marketing and I was very adaptable you know I didn't know at the age of 22 I didn't really know what I could do and what I couldn't do and um, and and then that was so that was 91 and then that carried on into 92 a bit more work with the Pet Shop Boys and a few other projects and some of these projects were concerts and um, and then at the beginning of 93 he, that's that's the kind of famous story he was getting very ill and he was approached to do a video for Suede and uh, so did Suede approach him yeah. yeah and why did they approach him just because. Was that because of the Wanderer. It just came out that no, way. The Wanderer was oh, made by. I was like, oh, no, wait for these guys. Lewis and Crab. That's right. The Wanderer was a film made by David and Andy went just after they worked on a different film with Derek. So that, it, was, it was, wasn't because of the Wanderer. Okay. Funnily enough, the Queen is Dead film brought Derek Jarman to Brett's attention as well. So we shared this connection that was we, how we both kind of really discovered. And of course, you know, he he'd seen other films but not connected them like Jubilee, the punk film that Derek made and things like that. So, um, so we that was something we, we sort of shared. But anyway, so the, the, we were all working together, David and Andy and I, on different things and different projects. And De- uh, Derek Swade asked Derek to make this video, and he was too ill. And you know the rest of the story. David and Andy made it. Yeah. 
Because I'd been doing these other concerts with Derek, the, partly because I wanted to get one of these concerts really, really on the money, really, really right. Because the other concert had been quite small, there were some of the other ones where we'd used the films and stuff, and I was like, I really want to get this right. Um, and you know, Suede are really good, and and it was a really good opportunity. So that's when we met. We met up with the band. And that was your first time. That was the first time. Yeah, it was March, and I think the album was number one that week. Mm. So it was, I think. It was from memory. It was March '93, yeah. and um, it might have been a little bit before that. It might have been February, but it was around about then. March '93. Yeah, in terms of when we met. Yeah, might have just been released. called the album. Yeah, I thought I think the album was out, and it all happened very quickly. It was 29th of March, wasn't it? I think the gig was announced in April. Mm. Sold out really quickly, mm. and then um, so David and Andy and I put that together where we, you know, we worked out which of Derek's films to use with which songs uh, and then of course you know Chrissy Hind and Susie Sue sang there as well um, and and when we started that project I wasn't a huge suede fan you know I was like yeah they're alright but, but by doing that project I discovered the more theatrical songs so Breakdown Sleeping Pills you know and those songs are still alive and those, those songs were the songs that converted me
So it's a bit of a strange story, but you know, if you think about it, I was very involved in music, and then, you know, then I ended up accidentally in kind of this news kind of career, which was never really going to be what I wanted to do. But I learned a lot. I learned a lot about journalism, I learned a lot about production. And then I started working with Derek, and and then about, it was a year before the Sway, before the Clapham Grand Show. A year before the Clapham Grand Show, I. I, uh, um, TVM lost their franchise and so we, it was brilliant and I was about to resign because I was saying on my business so I got a big redundancy check and a big redundancy pe pe check back then bought an Apple Mac because Apple Macs were really expensive so I got my redundancy check and bought an Apple Mac and that was that was the beginning of the company or the business and um, and then in, I spent the 90s doing the, the company really grew it was called Believe which doesn't sound very good now but it sounded good then and um it was uh, an event company, so we, I was working like with film companies and with bands. Um, so I was still working with Pet Shop Boys, I was still working with Suede and a few other artists. And um, and then the work that I carried on doing with Suede. So if you if you look at introducing the band, for example, you'll see at the end it says the Believe Organisation yeah, Interference. That today. Interference. Interference. That was yeah, part yeah, yeah. of that was part of my company. Yeah. I had all these little companies within it, yeah. and Interference was was uh, a, a kind of little production. Thing for, for that and um, you know so that was all through that, that company but we were, I was working with Walt Disney so I did strange things like I worked on the Lion King marketing with Disney and four weddings and a funeral and all the events and so it was actually a very big thing in my 20s and then along the way obviously I kept working with Suede so you know that DVD and, yeah, and, and that, that film and the tour films it was all kind of one long project it never but it was sort of something you know I'd kind of go off on tour with, and then come back yeah and then one of the things that people don't know but it is in Brett's new book so people will was um, uh, so I don't think I'm revealing any kind of great secret because it, 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 it's in that book is that when when Richard Oakes first joined Sway he wasn't 18 he had to live with an adult so he lived with me <laughs> which is which is if you saw what was going on in my life at this point, age 25, poor Richard lived with me from the minute he joined Suede, um, which was kind of, you know, August 94. And then I was obviously on that tour when we made all this. So it was this very surreal kind of six months where poor Richard was kind of living with me. And he was very cool, but my house was chaos because I had this big house. Loads of people lived there. It was kind of, you know, it was, it was never a kind of big, heavy kind of, you know, drug scene and like that. It was a kind of bit of a party house. But it was just kind of funny in the East End. And Richard, you know, age 17, was kind of 
had to live with a responsible adult and he got me. And they got you? Yeah. And you know, obviously, once the Dogman Star Tour was over, he you know, got his place and, and that was that. But so we still have this slight kind of bond because for a little while, you know, you know, he lived with me. Did that you do his washing and stuff? No, he did his own washing. Did he? Yeah. Did he, like, cook and stuff? Yeah, well, we, were, we weren't there a lot. Oh, okay. The tour was on. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I remember the first. I remember very clearly the first time he came home from the studio. He'd recorded. They'd, re- they'd he'd recorded together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've still got the dat that he brought home from the studio, with like the dem, you know, where they re- they demoed it. Yeah. And he was sort of just sat there playing because it was the first sw- song he'd written, and it was it was very it was great. You know, it was a lovely, lovely kind of. You know, after all that pain of that year, you know, there's uh, a. Yeah. You know, that's lovely. I think it's a good job that we we have that connection, you know, that it's not just about because you know, I've always had sort of very solid friendships with all the band, but you know, it's like any group of friends, you know, sometimes you're more friends with one than the other. Yeah. So you know, Simon and I were kind of great social friends through the nineties and that period Richard lived with me. Neil and I you know, hung out a bit. Um, and Matt, Matt and I we probably saw less of each other because he was in that relationship with Anissa for very, you know, and still is obviously so they, they were they were kind of quite stable and but you know we always hung out on, on the kind of trips and then um, and Brett and I so you know hung out a lot and we were friends so, you know because we were from the tours and things but then and then of course Brett and I ended up coincidentally living very near each other in Somerset who did it first? I did he followed you. But he didn't actually. He found. <laughs> they found a house. They were looking somewhere else, and they found the house. And it, they, they weren't looking in Somerset. And I was at the, a gig. It was on the Night Thoughts tour. And it, so was it Margate or something like that on the coast somewhere? Folkestone, maybe. But one of those kind of towns on the southeast coast. And um, I went backstage, and and Brett went, "Oh, guess what? I bought a house near you in Somerset." <laughs> so there you go. So now we're neighbours. Kind of. Ah, he followed you. Mm. Mm. But that's okay. Mm. I mean, we actually, we actually, you know, in some sense, we've got. There's a lot of other musician and London friends who've moved down there. We're not the only ones. No, no, no. Yeah, but yeah. But it's it's nice. It's um, it's it's good. And and you know, at the end of the day, you know, they they still have a place in London, and and um, you know, Brett's quite London centric. So I don't think we'd have the Blue Hour, obviously, if it wasn't Somerset. Very much an album about uh, the countryside. Yeah. No, that's true. Isn't you know, it? There's not much roadkill in Hackney, is there? I don't know. Maybe. Or th- Chelsea. Maybe there is. Maybe there is. Isn't there? Maybe there is. I don't know. <laughs>
Before you yeah. met, because it, it awakened me to kind of aesthetic and politics and a yeah. whole load of stuff that I wasn't really aware of. Yeah. And then he changed my life after we'd met because he was an incredible enabler. He was an incredible mentor. So you know he'd kind of go right. Well, you can do this. You know he'd get he'd get he was you know he was like this with a few people, not just me. But he he had to like the person. You go, right, I'm going to give you this job. You do this project with me. You do this project with me. And I ended up doing a lot of different projects and a lot of different things. And um, he was an incredible, incredible enabler. And I'm not entirely sure I'd have the life that I have now if I hadn't met Derek. You know? I mean, so, it, you know, I, 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 might, I might have had this life. I think it would be different. I don't think it would be the same life. But, you know, think about it, you know? I wouldn't have met Petra Boys, I wouldn't have met yeah. Suede, I wouldn't have necessarily got into filmmaking, you know. I might have ended up in more of a TV career, a traditional news career, it wouldn't have been necessarily as cultural. Well, maybe. Maybe, You never know, Piers Morgan, oh God. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna say anything, he's got lawyers. Mm. But it is incredible, absolutely incredible that someone can change your life like yeah. that. Yeah, no, it was. And, um, it, you know, I think everybody needs. It met from, uh, I was having this conversation with another friend of mine who works in fashion about somebody the other day, and we were we've been helping a friend of mine out on the fashion front, and and um, we were talking about how important it is that you know certainly when you're in, if you're in the kind of the arts and you're in the creative world, you really need a mentor. You need somebody who's going to help you, but you don't know it at the time. They can really really shape. You know, but if you look in, it's funny, prior to my mum dying, my mum died when I was 32, so it was uh, 2001. Prior to that, all my credits are Michael Christie, because my mum hated... Yes, Michael, I've my, seen that. My mum hated seeing the word Mike in print. Oh, no. So all the TV programmes, everything, prior Michael. to my mum dying, are Michael. And everything after my mum died, are Mike. <laughs> but, um, which is one of those sort of slightly weird things. So, uh, why did I mention that? I don't know why I mentioned that. I don't know. That. No. But that, no, that's interesting. I did see Michael and I did chuckle when I saw it. Right? So you did the Cat and Grad, you oh, did yeah. the Dogman Star. But then I do other things then... like things like Blackpool. You know, ah, yes. which is an odd yeah. one. Because yeah. that was when you know the band wanted to play some odd venues and I managed to talk the Tower Ballroom into doing their first ever rock concert. Ah. They'd never done one before. Oh. And because I was organising events in the film world and promoting events in the film world, I could promote that concert, you know? Oh, well, that's quite So nice people don't realise that I was doing kind of a lot of film premieres and other types of events. So I, you know, I knew, my company knew how to do that stuff. And then, um, yeah, and then what else did we do? And then obviously the Roundhouse video, which was very, 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 very... Um, it was... It was quite, you know, it was, I got some mates with cameras, basically, and then we edited it. It was a really good, because, you know, those concerts were special, you know? Yeah. That coming up period was really, yeah, yeah, really yeah. quite special, you know, all around. Yeah. And, um, gosh, I was nearly there. 25 years. Yeah, I was uh, there. And really? I spoke to the singer of Sub Circus, not that you want to know this, and um, I said hello and he just blanked me. <laughs> I think that's yeah, that's rude. So rude. So rude. I would. I wouldn't have liked it. It was quite funny. I remember when um, when Neil Tennant came on stage to do his songs. Brett was, you know, in his kind of mad, energised, creative kind of mindset, running around like you know. He ran off stage. 
Neil came on, he ran off. And Brett went, ran into the audience by, by mistake. And I was like, can I come back here? And he was like, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> like, he was like I want to watch, I want to watch. Like, you're, you're not going in the audience. Like, you know. So yeah, cause basically, so every now and again, I go off and tour manage, you know? And it was kind of a, it, was, it wasn't exactly a holiday. There's, there's, there's one itinerary where I'm credited as wine taster. It says, tour manager Charlie Charlton, wine taster Mike Christie. It's quite funny. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a very sort of fluid and that working relationship and social relationship. And, and that, in a way, is, and not, you know, I, started, and I, I bought the camera in 94. I started filming, Simon was filming, you know. So I was, then I was filming backstage at the Albert Hall and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, it was, it was a long history of me recording and then Simon stealing the tapes. And um, so in a strange way, the, the documentary didn't just wrap things up for them of that period. Yeah. It, it, in a way, it wrapped things up for me because, you know, in 97, yeah. after the coming up tour was, you know, kind of getting into the, kind of the middle of it. And, and at the point where really, well, it was kind of coincidental that it was getting a bit druggy. But that was the moment at which I decided I needed a career. And I didn't want to do events. I didn't want to just kind of hang out on tour. And, you know, the company was doing well. Yeah. And so, 97 to 98 was when I changed career. And I always went to the gigs. I always, went, you know, we always had any social occasions, always right through to the, the band splitting. I, I, was, I was there. But... I was more, a little bit more removed. So. How did you feel when they split? It's a good question. I know how I felt. I, I, I actually went to the Astoria gig with Matt Lucas. Funny enough. Oh, did you? Yeah. But you did his... Because I worked for Little Britain. Yeah. Little Britain down under. Yeah, and, and yeah. something else. And, all, I did, ah. and um, another Little Britain. And Matt's a, a big suede from. Yes. Um, and... Uh, how did I feel this split up? It, I mean, you know what? At the end of the day, it was sad, but it felt like the right thing to do. It felt like it was kind of, it needed a break. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm not even entirely sure I listened to A New Morning more than once, you know? I, li- I did like, like everyone else, I liked, I did listen to head music, but it didn't feel like progress. So I think ultimately it was the right thing to do. I think now we know it was the right thing to do. Definitely the right thing to do. You do know there are hidden gems on A New Morning that you should listen to. Well, <clears throat> Send me a playlist. I will send you a playlist. I guess. 
One more question. Um, I just wanted to talk about current day. Current, just present day. Present day. So 2003 they ended, and then you got involved again. Well, uh, um, you were always involved. I went. The, what happened was, is I went along to film. I was always around. Yes. And um, the, when they when they decided to do the Albert Hall, uh, Charlie and Brett. Uh, we were talking at that point. We'd been talking about doing the film around the time they got back together. It was a conversation we kept having. Anyway, we, we decided that we should obviously film. So I went to the rehearsals for the Albert Hall and filmed the rehearsals. And then I filmed the 100 Club and then I filmed backstage in the dressing room. So all yes. it's, you see all that stuff. Like when they yes. come off stage, that's me filming. And, um, you know, but there's about 10, 12 tapes from the 100 Club, the, sound, the rehearsals and the Albert Hall, you know. And um, it's nice, isn't it? It's nice that I was filming that. And so I don't really feel like I went anywhere, you know? Um, no. I mean, I, I only saw Brett, while they were split up, I saw Brett a couple of times. I went to his wedding and I went to his engagement party and uh, and I went to, I bumped into him in a nightclub once. And um, so I think I sort of saw him about three or four times during that seven years. But he was in Ibiza, he was away a lot. and. You know, it was, we were all in different places, really. And my TV career was really taking off. So, so does that answer the question? That does answer the question, yes. Well, thank you very much, Sam Hand. I've not finished oh. yet. One more minute. One more minute. Okay, one more we minute. But my friend's there. No, you don't. No, it's fine. We'll leave it. Go on, then. One more minute. No, no, no. I was just going to say how brilliant the Insatiable Ones DVD is, the Aww. film is, the documentary, it's and great how package, you've just, I don't know, You've just told us the suede story as it should be told mm. by the one they trust. So. Well, I think the important thing is, it's not, it, it isn't even for, it's not, it's not for the fans, and it's, and it's not for me, and it's not for the band. It's for history. Yeah. I know it sounds strange, but it's about, you know, it's about just getting the record straight. Yeah. You know, and saying to people, this is a really, really important band. Here's why, and here's what happened. Yeah. And I think, as I said to you, and you quoted back to me that. You know, it's only really by processing all of those things that really you can move past them. It's like therapy. Yeah. You know, it's always like therapy making these films. And I can see in the band the benefits of having made that film. And you know, and that's a, that film. I've made a lot of films, and that film is the film out of all of them that n no one really wanted to make. Everybody yeah. was really nervous. You know, Richard Oakes, I don't think, had done an interview for eight years. You know? Um, and so, you know, there were a lot of conversations about whether or not we should make the film. But the best thing is, everyone's glad we did. Transport the precious loves with a bag in our hands. Fly to pin me and my patient man just by the hot shoulder. This few understand. Do we fool ourselves?
Well, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Mike Christie, for joining me in conversation today. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you insatiable ones for tuning in, for your continued support 
and stay insatiable.